So, whilst the first video on recrystallisation wasn't as smooth or as professional as I might like, um, I think it was okay. Uh, so I'm going to follow it up with a video answering typical exam type questions on the recrystallisation process. Now I think what would be the best way to go about doing this is if before I go through the questions you've downloaded them, had a go at them yourself and then you watch the video to see if you get the answers right and see if there's any points that you haven't, haven't thought of or missed or not included. Um, so do the questions first and then go through this video. So question one. Outline how a chemist chooses which solvent to use when purifying an organic solid. So, I apologise by the way for the background noise, it's the washing machine going on in the background. Uh, it's the problem of uh, recording this in a very small flat. Uh, so, you need to make two considerations. Um, you need to think about when the solid, or when the solvent, is hot, and when the solvent is cold. So when the solid solvent is hot, the product should dissolve. Now why do we want the product to dissolve when the solvent is hot? Well, that enables us to dissolve our product, so the product disappears. We can't see it, but some of the impurities will be insoluble, which means they stay solid in that hot solvent. So that means that the product dissolves and disappears, the insoluble impurities are kept as a solid in that beaker. So here's our beaker, okay, there's our liquid, and here's our insoluble impurities, and that means we can filter those out, leaving just leaving behind the solvent in here and with the solvent we've also got our product. Okay, so it enables us to remove insoluble impurities. Now when we've got our cold solvent we want the product to be insoluble. The product is insoluble. And the reason we need the product to be insoluble there is that when we've got our solvent, which is hot, and the product is dissolved, we then cool it down. So we then cool it down, and I apologise for the change of colour, we then cool it down, and as we're cooling it, the product recrystallises out because it's insoluble when it is cold. So all of a sudden we get lots and lots and lots of our product crystals recrystallizing out. One has actually missed the beaker. I mean, how terrible is that? Okay, so that's why we go through this process of determining the solvent. It all depends on the substance we're purifying. The substance needs to dissolve in the solid, sorry, the substance needs to dissolve in the solvent when the solvent is hot, and the substance needs to be insoluble when the solvent is cold. So the phrase I often use is the product is sparingly soluble in the solvent. Now you can see that I haven't written everything down. Okay, I've talked a huge amount and those points you do need to include in your answer. Okay, so I'm not spoon feeding it, okay, and it's not just a me write and you copy. Okay, you do need to include the points that I'm saying in your answer. On to question two. The impure solid should be dissolved in a minimum amount of hot solvent. Explain why. Now that's quite an open-ended question because the question doesn't make it clear whether it wants to explain why we dissolve it in a minimum amount or whether we use a hot solvent. So you need to explain why for both of them. 
Well, the reason we use a minimum amount is to help our recrystallization at the end of the process. If we use a large amount of solvent, and when we cool the solvent down at the end, some of our product would remain dissolved in the solvent if we had a large amount of solvent in there. In fact, it might even struggle to recrystallize out in the first place. So we use a minimum amount to ensure crystals or product recrystallize in cold solvent at the end and do not remain in solution. Why do we use a hot solvent? And a hot solvent is required to ensure the product dissolves in the first place to allow us to filter any insoluble impurities. So to allow insoluble impurities to be removed by hot filtration. Why is the solution initially filtered while still hot? And that's quite that's physically very difficult to do. You have to get a hot filter funnel and keep that hot and pour your liquid through it, or your mixture of liquid and insoluble impurities through it while it's still hot. And well, that, the per primary purpose of doing it is to remove insoluble impurities but why do we do it while still hot and the reason we do it while still hot is to ensure the product doesn't recrystallize out at this point If it recrystallizes out, the product ends up caught in this filter paper here along with the insoluble impurities. So we get a very poor yield of product. So to ensure the product does not recrystallize and it remains in solution. In other words, dissolved and not mixed up with the insoluble impurities. After doing that, the hot solution is then cooled, and the question asks us, why do we cool it down in an ice bath? And that's because um, solids have a lower solubility at lower temperatures. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that at a lower temperature, solids are less willing to dissolve, which means when we are cooling our solution down, the maximum amount of solid will reappear in our solution if the solution is as cold as we can get it. How do we put that in a sort of exam type language? So solids have a lower solubility at lower temperatures, so the maximum of product recrystallizes the maximum amount of product recrystallizes and 
very little remains dissolved in the solvent. Quite a nice question this. When you've got your crystals in your solution, you're going to filter them out of the mixture by vacuum filtration. Give two advantages of doing it by vacuum filtration. Well, it's nice and quick. Okay, and it produces a relatively dry product. And the final question, how can the purity of the organic product be determined? In other words, how do we know how pure it is? Well, we could uh, perform chromatography on our solid. We could dissolve it in a solvent and then run a chromatogram. And chromatography should show only one spot. And then we should also test its melting point. And the melting point should have two things. It should be a sharp melting point. In other words, it melts over a narrow range. And if you've got a data book value for your product, um, your melting point should be close to the data book value. And hopefully uh, these questions have helped to consolidate your knowledge and understanding of the process of recrystallisation.